Welcome to New York City and Mission City Church. We're here to connect people with God and with each other. We hope you're encouraged by this week's message. Hello. Um, today we'll be reading Philippians 2, 1 through 4. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Wonderful to be with you, church. And uh, we, we've missed you. And if it's your first Sunday, you wouldn't know why I'm saying that. But um, my name is Garrett, and I serve as pastor here. And I've been out for a whole month. So um, only a little more than half of that planned. Uh, there's been a family health emergency with my dad of late. And so over the last month, we did kind of a half rest, half uh, family emergency hospital, you know, kind of a thing out of town where, where my dad is. So he is doing a little bit better than he was a week or two ago. So I know some of you have asked, so just wanted to say thank you for your prayers. And um, just want to say thank you in general. Thank you for the opportunity to rest. Thank you for the opportunity to be away and for your for your support, for your prayers, um, and for all that you mean to us. When we say we miss you, church, um, not only do we mean it, but we mean something specific. When we say we miss our church, we don't really mean um, the, the, the place or the, or the stuff, you know, or the church infrastructure, or uh, even the gathering itself. We mean we miss you, the people. That's the thing we mean the most when we say we miss you. We mean it very literally. We miss you. So... It's good to be back in the, in the presence of all of you. I heard while I was gone, it was, um, the weather was perfect and that it was logistically uneventful. Um, that's, of course, the act, absolute opposite of what happened. Um, I heard it was hot. I heard it was, there was a flood. Evidently, there was a roof leak that kind of came to right where I'm standing. Um, we went downstairs for a week. Um, I, heard, uh, I heard a lot uh, took place. So thank you. I also heard uh, about um, leaders leading and I heard about people serving. I heard about new friends coming around. And uh, in other words, I heard that we continued connecting people with God and with each other, which is what we're here to do. So um, thank you all so much. And what a gift it is to be back, you know. Um, so here we go today. Um, I'm going to start by telling you we're raising a two-year-old right now. And that means we use these two words a lot. Uh, same two words on repeat. They're help me. I'm just kidding. There are these words. Um, if then. If then. So we're trying to kind of just teach some basics. Two-year-olds don't even have the basics, so we're just trying to teach with simple language. We're doing a lot of if-then. Um, if-then, there's a lot of versions of. You can do the simple, which is, of course, if you do, do well, there will be reward. If you do poorly, there will be consequence. But if-then can get a lot more interesting than that. Um, you can do the bargaining, which is like if you, eat, if you want more bananas or whatever sugary thing you're fixed on, um, then eat more peas or anything green first. So there's like the bargaining version of the if-then. Um, there's the explanation, so which is more like if you quit splashing around, then the shampoo will not run in your eyes and this bath will be over quicker. You know, you're explaining things. Um, there's also the side eye command, like if you want me to answer you, then stop whining. You know, so there's a lot of ways that if then can actually work. And I think in adult life, we get more complex versions of this, um, but it never really goes away. There's a lot of if then that we continue to interact with in our adult lives as well even if it doesn't feel so simplistic. So if then for us as adults can represent relief, like if I had taken that job, then I would be miserable right now. And so we're relieved. I'm so glad I did not take that job, right? There is the uh, opportunity. If then can dress itself up as opportunity and, and, as, and as motivation. So if I work extra hard and buy in, then I may get promoted, et cetera. If then can represent missed opportunity though. Like if I had bet on that investment, then our situation might be different right now. Or it could even intensify to, to, to retroactive guilt. If then can be a powerful guilt feeling. Like if I had not made wrong turns in my marriage, then, then I would still be married. Or, or if I had said no earlier, then I might not have an addiction on my hands right now. If then is a powerful and a flexible thing. I'm not telling you if then always tells you the truth. So sometimes our if-then thoughts can tell us lies and discourage us. But if-then is always, always powerful. So we're going to actually spend the next few minutes together opening the scriptures. And there is a powerful if-then 
statement, much, uh, much more complex than what we would uh, expose, say, a two-year-old to, but still understandable, right? So the right mix of it. This is God speaking to adults in if-then terms. Um, today, we'll see it. We have been studying the New Testament letter of Philippians. Usually, when people refer to Philippians, we call it the book of Philippians, um, as in books of the Bible. But it's actually a letter. So this is a letter uh, not only written ultimately from God, ultimately to all people, but in, in, in the immediate sense, it was written from the first century apostle, the early Christian leader, Paul, um, who wrote over half of the New Testament, actually. And he wrote it in terms of number of books of the Bible. And he wrote it uh, to an early Christian church in a place called Philippi, which was a real town, uh, not a particularly exciting one. Um, it's in present day northeastern Greece, or I should say it was in present day northeastern uh, Greece because it's really no longer there. You know, if you were to go there today, it's mostly ruins, which means it's an outdoor museum that people, usually Bible enthusiasts and people curious about this, uh, would go to and observe. Hey, this was the place that Paul, all those years ago, was writing to. So this is from Paul to Philippians, ultimately inspired by God to us. That is, we view it as scripture as well. And so we've been studying that uh, the last three weeks. And by the way, thank you to all the communicators who, who led and taught and encouraged over the last three weeks. I was hearing the podcast from a distance the last few weeks and really encouraged by what I was hearing and uh, also kind of jealous that I didn't get to teach Philippians 1. I'm going to have to wait for that another time. But uh, thank you to all of our leaders who, who took care of us thus far. We're going to pick it up in chapter 2 today uh, with, with four verses that are very much structured in an if-then sense designed to encourage a particular set of behaviors. All right, so let's, let's experience this together. Here it comes. This is Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. So if, there's your if, and then there's several, several ifs that are going to be attached to that one. Four, to be exact, they are all going to be attached to that. So we kind of got an extended if clause that's about to come in here. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, meaning if you, if, if you find any sense of like, bolstering for your spirit in Jesus Christ. Like if you've ever been encouraged by Jesus Christ, not just like Christian tradition or somebody else's faith, but if you've ever actually personally derived encouragement from the person of Jesus Christ as a person, not as a myth or a legend, I'm talking about as a real person, if you've ever felt encouragement in Christ, and then your translation may or may not say the if again, but it's definitely understood, right? If any comfort from love, understood to be his love. You know, love is a comforting thing. Like whenever we feel loved, we feel a sense of security attached. That's the way love works. We feel it from a divine level. When we feel loved by God, we feel a sense of security. We feel it from a human level. If we feel loved by other people, we feel this sense of, it's comforting. It's like being surrounded by a pillow. You're like, nothing bad can happen. I'm loved. You know, there's a certain security that takes place whenever we know that we're loved from God and that we're loved by people as well. And the converse is true also. If you feel unloved, if you have a sneaking suspicion, maybe they don't love me. Maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe I'm not loved. You know, if that sneaking suspicion is in any relationship, whether with God or with people, that will actually be very powerful and make you uncomfortable, right? So knowing that you're loved will instantly make you comfortable and secure. But not knowing that you're loved will instantly make you uncomfortable in any relationship. And of course, if Jesus says greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends, then Jesus is the best lover of human souls ever. Jesus is the love that makes people, if you're looking for the, the true comfort of truly being loved, you're looking for the love of God. And so what Paul is doing here is he's saying, okay, if you have ever been encouraged by Christ, if you've ever been comforted by the love of God and those who love God, and then he keeps going. If any participation in the spirit, meaning if you have any, maybe a better word is a fellowship in the spirit. If you have a, a close enough friendship, you know, they didn't, they didn't translate it friendship here because it's just not quite strong enough in the way that we commonly use friend. I mean, we use the word friend. Oh, that's my friend from back in college. Do you still talk? No. Okay. Well, that, you know, that's not strong enough for what we're getting to here. You know, we're getting to like active participation in an ongoing relationship. Fellowship or participation are usually the two words that they translate that one uh, with. So if you have any fellowship and, and participation with the Holy Spirit, meaning you remember when Jesus uh, was still alive and on earth uh, and, and, and before his death and his resurrection and his ascension, he told 
his followers that he was going to go away, but in his place he was going to send the Holy Spirit as a counselor and a comforter to remind us of, of God's love, and also as a, as a teacher to guide us in all the ways that we should go. So Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit. And Paul, a few days, a decades after Jesus has said that, now in Philippians later, Paul is saying, are you experiencing that? If you have any fellowship with the Holy Spirit, if you can sense in your heart and in your mind, there's a presence there. You know, I remember noticing this for the very first time when I first started walking with Jesus Christ, when I first started to participate in the Spirit, I knew the Holy Spirit was there um, because I was about 19 or 20 years old. And before then, I would have told you I was a Christian my whole life, but I wasn't participating in the Spirit. You know, I, I don't think that I was... I don't believe that I had a relationship with God, to tell you the truth. I think I was, um, I think I was kind of coasting off of my, perhaps my culture's faith or my grandparents' faith or something like that. The problem is God doesn't have any grandchildren, only children. You know what I mean? Like we have to choose to let him become our father, right? So that happened for me around the time I was 19 or 20 years old. And all of a sudden I could tell the Holy Spirit was in my life because in certain ways, like certain illicit pleasures or foolishness or just habits I was in or addictions I was in and just certain patterns of lying, drinking, sleeping around, whatever I happened to be doing as a young man, all of a sudden I found myself uncomfortable with all of that. And the spirit of God was in me at that point telling me that's no longer part of who you are and who you're going to be. We're coming out of that, right? So all of a sudden, and it didn't come from within. That's my whole point. It wasn't like I woke up one day and was like, I should really make a change. It wasn't like that. It didn't come from within. It came from outside somewhere. And it was the Spirit of God speaking to me inside my own mind, even if it was as vague as just impressions. I'm not talking about like an audible voice, although I suppose God could do that if he wanted. I'm talking about the sense in my spirit that what used to be okay is no longer okay. And the things I didn't used to care about, like God, church, loving human beings, you know, studying the scriptures as the word of God, certain things that I used to not care about at all, all of a sudden I sensed in my spirit, those are important. Those are a lot more important than I just spent 20 years acting like they were. And so all of a sudden I was drawn to new things that were positive and that were God-centered. And that was the first sign I remember, oh, this is what fellowship with the spirit is. This is what participation is in the Holy Spirit is. I am feeling the Spirit of God nudge me and say, hey, that thing that's been going on for a long time, no more, or that thing that hasn't been going on for a long time that needs to go on, that's what we're gonna start doing. And I just felt the Holy Spirit just kind of take almost like someone's hands reaching over and grabbing the wheel a little bit while I was driving and all of a sudden uh, just feeling the influence of another on my life and in my heart. That's what it feels like to, to fellowship with the Spirit. And not only that, but to find it precious to realize, hmm, that whisper from God inside my own heart and mind, that's precious. That's my invitation to participate with God. I don't want to ignore that. I want to participate with it. Because now all of a sudden relating to the Holy Spirit is not something I want to behave my way out of. I want to experience this on an ongoing basis. That's what participation is with the Spirit. Not an old friendship that's gathering dust, an active one. And then he gives one more if. If any affection and if any sympathy... Meaning, if you know Jesus Christ in this way, if you know the love of God in this way, if you know the participation and fellowship of the Holy Spirit in this way, it's going to soften your heart. Like you're just not going to be this hard-hearted person who is just edgy and that everyone kind of avoids. There's going to be some sort of tenderness in you. There's going to be some sort of affection and sympathy, and you're going to find yourself noticing things at a spiritual and perhaps even emotional level about your own and about other people's human experiences that just touch your emotions in a way that previously you might have just totally ignored. That's part of the Christian journey is to have God soften you from the inside out, to have affection and to have sympathy. And so what Paul is doing here is he's saying, if any of this applies to you, church, he's like scraping the room and he's like, if any of this applies to any of you, he's getting ready for a big then, a series of thens coming up in a moment, a moment. But let's just linger on the ifs for a second. Ask yourself, am I experiencing the encouragement of Jesus Christ? Have I ever? So you could ask yourself this both initially, like have I ever begun to? But you could also ask yourself on an ongoing basis, like, am I now? Because it doesn't really matter if you, you know, felt it 10 years ago, but what about now? You know, so ask yourself in terms of your initial, uh, in terms of your initial relationship with God and ask yourself on an ongoing basis. Okay, did I, is, was there ever a time I began to find encouragement in Christ? Have I ever begun or is it time to begin? 
And if you've begun, are you still experiencing the encouragement from Christ? Or has something gone wrong and we need to go back and look for encouragement in him? Or are we looking for encouragement everywhere else? There's so many other places you can draw encouragement. Ask yourself, is Jesus Christ even in the mix? Or is it pure entertainment, experiences, some future version of yourself that you're building, a career, pop psychology, and some sort of cheap positivity? There's all kind, We all need encouragement. It's just a matter of where we're going to get it. Are we getting it in Jesus Christ or are we looking to get it from somewhere else? Where are we drawing right now? Where are you? Ask yourself. Don't, don't assume, yeah, that's me. Let's get to the then. Well, hang on. Ask yourself, are you drawing the comforts of love from God? We all need the comforts of love. There's no such thing as a human being. Don't pretend to be tough. I've met a, t- a person or two in the course of a, uh, of a decade or so of ministry who's like, I don't, I don't need to feel loved. I don't need to feel loved. And it's like, <laughs> you don't know yourself. Yes, you do. Everyone needs to be loved. Everyone needs to be loved. It's not toughness to not need to be loved. It's self-deception. You need to be loved. So where are you drawing the comforts that come from that love? Where are you looking Are you looking in the love of God right now? Are you looking in a substance, an altered state of mind, uh, a weekend, sleep, freedom, uh, some sort of fake relationship like serial dating, hookups, pornography, etc.? And if you say, well, what's wrong with serial dating, hookups, and pornography? Well, here's the problem. They only comfort for a time and then to lead to the discomfort of realizing it was fake all along. There's discomfort waiting at the end. It's not real, right? Real love comes from God, and none of, no other option will ever comfort like the explosive fact that God loves me. That's the only one that lasts day after day and season after season. Ask yourself, are you fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit? I have to ask myself that. If I, I sense myself, sometimes I'm like, I am in a bad mood. Am I fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit? Not even close. Like, I am not participating with the Holy Spirit right now. I'm just out here reacting to stuff, you know? And that's a good check for me. Am I being led of the Spirit, right? in this time? Are we fellowshipping with him or are we only fellowshipping with our latest reaction to whatever's going on in the world? And do we have that tender affection and sympathy? Or are we agitated and hard-hearted and angry and so on? What kind of fellowship do we have and what kind of affections do we have? Just check on yourself because if you're not there, let's go back to that. You can't do the then if you're not there, right? So let's, let's ask God to bring us there. But if the things Paul assumes are there, and that's where we're at, both at an, in terms of initiation and our ongoing living experience. And there's some very important thens that are all going to follow. And here they come. Then complete my joy. Now, you know, you, you might find that the word then is not printed there. I assure you it's understood. We have shifted to the imperative now. Complete my joy. He's telling you to do something. It's very conclusive and very obviously built on the previous thing, okay? So then, come, if that's the case for you, Complete my joy. Paul's saying, make me happy. You ever had like a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or something and be like, do it for me. One time when I was in high school, I decided I was going to do the long hair thing. It was a mistake. Uh, it, it looked bad. I didn't have good hair for long hair um, at all. Um, it was very moppy and just, it just wasn't a good head of hair to do the long hair, you know, high school kid thing. It just looked pretty bad. And so my grandfather, who was a cancer patient and barely ill at the time, I came to see him. And I thought he was going to laugh at it. He handed me a $20 bill, and he said, cut that hair. And then he says, for me. (laughs) And so I went and got a haircut. This is my granddad. What are you going to do? You know, so I went and cut my hair. So you ever had somebody be like, hey, I just want you to do it for me. If you love me, just do it for me. Okay, so that's the affection Paul has right here. He's saying, complete my joy. Okay, meaning it would make me very happy if you would build on the ifs with some thens that naturally follow. Okay, will you do these things and here they come by being one of the by sorry by being of the same mind more on that in a moment by being of the same mind having the same love being in full accord and of again one mind so a lot of same there a lot of one there right so same mind so there's some similarity there and are supposed to be in our minds More on that in a second. We're supposed to have the same love, so there's some sort of love that we're supposed to have inside of us that's supposed to be identical. Being in full accord, that means, you know, everything is harmonious, it fits together, that's kind of a same-ish type idea there. And then of one mind, again, comes back to the mind thing. So it's an emphasis on unity. That's what this is. It is an emphasis on unity in a church. That's what he's talking about. Now, if you're thinking, that's not easy... You're right, but it wasn't easy then either. 
So we know just from reading the rest of the New Testament that Philippi was a very cosmopolitan place at the time. So Philippi was a pretty diverse place, and the church had great diversity. And we know that because just from other passages of the Bible, we know that this church had a woman named Lydia, for starters. She was a Jewish convert from Asia and a wealthy businesswoman because it says in uh, scripture that she was a seller of purple. That means nothing to us now, okay? Because we're like, they sell purple. Why, why don't they sell green? Well, purple at that time was a symbol of, uh, of, of royalty in some cases, but always a symbol of wealth. So purple fabric, if you had purple fabric, it was considered special. Like you could, it was a luxury item in your home, okay? If you could have anything purple, it was understood. Well, Lydia traffics in purple, okay? Lydia sells purple. So she is a, she is a wealthy businesswoman. Then we're, we're told about a, a slave girl who was probably native Greek. We're told about a, a Philippian jailer who works for the Roman Empire and is probably therefore Roman, okay? Who comes to know Jesus Christ. So he's up in there somewhere. And then we've got people we find out about later in the book of Philippians, in this letter of Philippians, um, two women who were evidently in some sort of drama because later in the book, Paul is going to tell them to figure it out and to widen the circle so that other people in the church can help them figure it out. So now we've got two women in some sort of an active feud. So unity was probably not easy. It was probably not easy in the small church at Philippi to be of the same mind. And yet... The expectation of unity is there. The two references to the mind make me think that the thinking part of this is kind of where it starts. You know, scripture tells us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So it's, it's essential that there are certain things, church, that we think alike about, about which we think alike, and we consider them. So uh, now someone might be at this point one, uh, discouraged about just the general um, fractiousness and the fractured nature of our society right now. Um, it's fractured, and if you just need a word of encouragement, it's fractured because it does not participate with the spirit. That is why. Because it is not drawing the comfort from the love of God and applying it to other people. And that is, there's all sorts of intermediate and intermediary causes and that I'm kind of skipping over right now. But the ultimate, ultimate cause that this world is fractured in the way that it is, is ultimately because it does not draw comfort from love and encouragement from Jesus Christ and acquire the attendant sympathy and tenderness toward other human beings. That's the ultimate of the ultimate reason behind all of the reasons that we're fractured. So... If we abide with the Spirit of God and live in these realities, unity is possible. You know, I needed that pep talk at a key time in my life. It was when I was about to get married. So one piece of family history, um, I, have, I had a wonderful mother who has since passed away, and I have a wonderful father who happens to be my earthly hero. Um, but they weren't perfect and we weren't perfect and they don't expect me to stand up here and act like everything was perfect. So I don't mind telling you one of the things that was challenging about my upbringing was um, my dad was married five times and my mom was married five times by the time she passed away. So by the time it came time for me to get married, I was like, this doesn't work and I feel extremely nervous. I don't know how to believe that this doesn't break. Like I don't know how to believe that this doesn't break. You know what I'm saying? And I needed to be told and I was told um, not only by the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit, but by the scriptures themselves and by the examples lived out around me, that when all else breaks, it doesn't matter how many times you've seen it break, the ultimate reason for the break was failure to abide with Jesus Christ, to draw encouragement from him, comfort from his love, to fellowship with the Holy Spirit on an active basis on the key issues of life in day to day, and then to apply tenderness and sympathy to the other person. In other words, marriages that stay built on Christ don't end. If they begin, middle, and end, and they, they stay in Christ, then they don't end. And that's a, that's a bit of optimism I really needed at a time when I was entering into a relationship. So you see, whenever you enter into a relationship with church, and you've got a bunch of fractured society around you, you're probably wondering, is this going to work? I mean, is this, I mean, really, is this over-optimistic here? I mean, we're just diverse enough to make me nervous here. Like, are we really, go, is this going to work the way the Bible's ideals say it's going to work? And let me tell you, by the power of the Holy Spirit is the only way, but that one way is fail-proof. You see, that one way can't miss whenever we follow the Holy Spirit and participate in the love of God for one another. We won't be fractured. So that's just one word of optimism. Now, someone else might not have that problem, with this, but someone else might have the problem of, 
worrying about like groupthink. Like really, we're all supposed to think the same way? Like are we all supposed to be utterly identical in all of our viewpoints? And like are we trying to turn each other into carbon copies and like turn this into some kind of an like ideological echo chamber? Okay, if that was you. The answer to that is no also. The answer to that is no, we're not looking to make everybody think exactly the same on every single issue. He means something else when he says to be of one mind. Um, so, and the answer here is actually in the original language. So the, the, the New Testament was not written in English, believe it or not. Um, the, 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 the New Testament was written in Greek. And in the, the, the Greek language here, what you can see is, instead of saying, have the same mind, in the Greek, the actual verb is mind the same thing. So mind is the verb, but mind the same thing, meaning have a shared priority. Not mind the same way everything, but to mind the same thing, meaning we have one big priority that is the overarching goal here. It's not that we think the same thing about everything. It means we think the same thing about one thing, and that's Jesus Christ, right? That is what he's telling us to do. And it, and it happens again right here at the end of the verse when it says to be in full accord and to be of one mind. I love that one. That one in literal Greek says, mind the one thing. Look after, you know, we use the word mind, like look after it. Mind the one thing, meaning above all else, you mind the priority of Jesus Christ and all that is in him and that is involved in following him. That's the one thing that we're going to mind together. And if we all mind that together and our minds stay on that and we decide that that's how we're going to live together, then guess what? We will experience an undying fellowship one to another, even if it's work. Of course, it's going to be work. But if we are all minding the one thing, we will be together even as we are different because we're the same on the one thing, and the one thing is Jesus Christ. So we're going to mind this one thing. We've got to look after this church because we do a lot of different things. Listen, whenever, whenever you leave here, this is not a small village, okay? When you leave here, you're going to go do the different things, all right? You're going to take different ways home. When you go to work tomorrow, you're going to do the many things, okay? When you talk to each other about your interests and like what you find interesting, you may find like, oh, we are from a different planet here in terms of what do you think is interesting and what do I think is interesting and what do like kind of like high chemistry, low and like automatic chit chat, like where do those conversations go? You may find that the people around you are doing the many things, like things that you are not interested in and, and so on. Listen, I'll be honest with you. Uh, on election day, I bet this room probably does the many things, like many different things. I highly doubt that there is groupthink involved in, on, on ide political and sociopolitical issues and things like that. And that doesn't make me sweat at all. You know why? Because it's not the one thing that we're required to agree on. The one thing we're required to agree on is Jesus Christ. And when it comes time to express that in terms of our civic duty, you probably all have very different conceptions from one another about how to best represent the one thing in public society. And I'm perfectly comfortable with that disagreement as long as we understand we're all trying to express the one thing, which is Jesus Christ. And if we mind the one thing, no other many things make me nervous as a pastor. No problem whatsoever. And I believe we're focused on the one thing, church, because of the, the many things that could have hurt our fellowship or torn our church apart in its earliest, earliest stages never did. Got through a pandemic. Did you know that? We had like 20 people. Got through a pandemic with, with many diverse mindsets. And we get through the pandemic. And you know how many debates we had as a church about whether or not to wear masks? Zero. Because we're there to do the one thing. We're not there to talk about the other things and get distracted by all this. We made the best educated choice we could to honor society and make it welcoming for people and safe for you, and we went, right? We have made it through many a tumultuous societal moment by leaning hard into the scripture and the participation of the Holy Spirit. Do you see what I'm saying? So I have a lot of hope that this is possible. But don't, uh, don't trick yourself into thinking we're trying to create some sort of sameness in here that's not healthy. I'm telling you, if, when, when a church starts to all like parent their kids exactly the same way and like think about various issues in life the exact same way, it gets really claustrophobic to me in there. Like because there's just no room for differentiation of any kind. You don't want any part of that. I don't want any part of that. But what we do want very much is to be involved in the one thing and that is trusting Jesus Christ. He goes on, there's more thens. If all of the previous things, then do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. 
Um, if your translation starts with a, with, a, with a new sentence right there, they're just trying to break it up so it's not so long. Still the same sentence, still in the thens from the if. So if, if you're drawing love from Jesus Christ, then do nothing out of selfish ambition where you try to put yourself ahead. And don't do anything out of conceit. Don't do anything out of conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. I find interesting here that there's no other reason given to count everyone more significant than ourselves other than that they're standing there. It doesn't say because after all they are more significant than you because they have more money than you or a better job than you and they have more followers than you. There is no data given as to why we're supposed to treat everybody else as more significant than ourselves. It's just because they're standing there, right? Our little earthly petty scoreboards don't matter. We're told just to count everybody as more significant than ourselves just because they're standing there. Uh, I love the way um, that, uh, that one, one person uh, put this. This is a commentator on the New Testament, not the New Testament itself. This person wrote, problems of disunity, that's where I'm aiming for, right? To mind the one thing. Problems of disunity end when we discover respect for each other, not on this ground or that ground, but perhaps without any grounds. Counter to every ground, and simply because we're told to do so, ordered by God to reckon each other better than ourselves. Naturally, one does not think this way, but the divine command directed, not toward all, but to the Christian community. So this won't make sense. If you don't know Jesus Christ, who made himself small and counted others as more significant than himself, this will make no sense. But it says the divine community, or the divine command implies divine assistance to achieve the impossible. Meaning God has commanded us to count, if we have the encouragement that's found in Christ, and if we don't, this makes no sense. But if you have the encouragement that's found in Christ, we will be able to achieve the impossible, which is to count each other as more significant than ourselves and to stay away from selfish ambition and conceit. That Greek word for conceit right there um, is a, is a two-part word that literally means empty glory, empty glory. It's a two-part word. It, it could not be more clear. Keno, doxen. Keno means empty, nothing else. Doxen means glory and nothing else. Empty glory. So when you give yourself to conceit, you give yourself to empty glory. Glory that will never pay in the end. Glory that will not work. When you give yourself only to your own little glory, you're gonna come up empty. I ran this experiment, everybody, and I'll tell, I don't mind telling you, I built like over a decade of my life on this experiment. I was convinced that at five years old, I was convinced that one day I would be a baseball star. I was convinced. It's cute when you're five. It's a, it stings a little to say this at 35, all right? But uh, it's a little embarrassing. But I was convinced at five years old that I was on a, it was kind of a delusion of grandeur, that I was going to become really something special. Okay, in terms of, now I, I assume that work was part of it, you know, a lot, but that was it. It was, that was the romanticized narrative. Work hard, become amazing, okay? And, and my, my dad had played ball in college, and my little brother was soon to follow and play ball in college, but here's the problem. I got to the small college level, and I looked around, and I was like, reality just hurt a little. I'm like, I'm not better than these guys. Like, if you're going to be special, you have to play at a high level, and you have to stay the best one for a long time, okay? But I looked up at about, at about the, co the intermediate college level and I was like, I think I'm college average. Don't think I'm going anywhere. And so all of a sudden I ran smack into a reality that I had spent 15 years. It was never just baseball to me. Oh no, it was identity. It was, I was just building my whole life on this future image of myself. That was never going to happen. It was empty glory. It was empty glory. It was imaginary glory. It was Ken O'Doxon. It was never going to be there. It was only in my imagination. And it was never even going to be, it was never going to become what I thought it was going to become. Someone is thinking, but what if it had? You still, how many of you, you still wouldn't know. Like how many of you actually know great baseball players? Okay, you still wouldn't know. How many of you know who went into the Hall of Fame, which is like the highest circle of honor in the sport in say 1991? Unless it was your uncle, you don't know. Okay, you don't know. It's all empty glory, whether you get it or not, right? So here's what I want to tell you. We are prone to give ourselves to these 
things. We're prone to give ourselves to our imaginary glory of tomorrow. We're prone to be like, oh, but after I do this boot camp, I'm going to look like, and it's this future glory that we've got, okay? After I get this job, after I get this raise, I will be this, and I will have these options, and after I get in this kind of relationship with this kind of person, I will be this, and we just build empty glory upon empty glory, and it's like we just never learn that it never works out the way we think it's going to, and even if it does, it doesn't satisfy, it turns out to be empty. So empty glory is something to stay away from, and by the way, the only way to stay away from it is to give yourself to the glory of God. That's the only way to stay out of this trap. Otherwise, if you don't know the glory of God, you're going to give yourself to a lesser glory and it's going to come up empty every time. Final then, if you have all these things, then let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Look out for the interests of others. Why? Because they're there. Just because they're there and God is telling us to do this. Because Jesus cared for people just because they were standing there, we are going to look to the interests of others. I want you to walk, watch out for some individualism here. Um, we are in a highly individualistic era. We are in the era of the most possible, but what about me, me, me? We're me first and others if I get around to it kind of vibe. The New Testament seems to be like God first and then everybody else. And if we get around to you, you know, that's, that, we'll get there, okay? But it seems very God-centered and other-centered. And I've heard Christians in this individualistic era be like, see the word also, that's me. That means I have to look after myself because it says, after all, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, which means I should look after my own interests. Okay, here's the problem with that. I'm not disagreeing. I mean, that's what it implies. But if you read the verse that is literally telling you to look after the interests of others and your first reaction is, ooh, there's me. That is a problem, okay? If you're finding your safety in, ooh, I'm in there too. That's not good, okay? Is it implied? Sure, it's implied. But if you've got to make the background the foreground so you can feel like, ooh, my interests are taken care of, you need to calm down and probably look after some other people, okay? Because this, is, this verse is not about us, right? Now, does God tell you to neglect yourself to the point that you starve and have no ability to care for other people? No, but often we use self-care as an ongoing excuse that once we are cared for, we never seem to get around to caring about anybody else, right? It becomes an endless self-care quest is the problem. That's the, that's the problem with the self-care quest. Not that it exists, but that it never comes to an end, right? We never actually get around to other people all too often, right? Now look, I'm gonna take, uh, I, I'm gonna take a nap today. I'm gonna sleep today. I'm gonna eat tomorrow. Okay, don't push this to the point of insanity. Thanks for being with us. If these messages are strengthening you in your faith, we want to hear from you. Find us online at missioncity.nyc or email us at info at missioncity.nyc so we can celebrate everything God's doing in your life. We'll see you next week.